Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar program, Restoring Intestinal Barrier Function During Aging with Insights from GI Map. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. We've got Dr. Fabian, who is a leading expert on the role of microbiome in health, immune function, chronic disease, and aging. And at this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Fabian to begin his presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. So I hope you are all set to hear a lot of information today related to aging and the intestinal barrier. So we're gonna actually do a pretty deep dive into this topic. Uh, we're gonna get into a little bit about how aging influences the barrier. Uh, really gonna get into the details of intestinal barrier assessment that goes pretty far beyond the typical traditional approaches that focus on leaky gut. So that's gonna be a key theme today is really expanding our view of the intestinal barrier. How do we assess that with comprehensive stool testing with GI map? Uh, and then how do we take that information and combine that with some of the most recent information that has been coming out from research on how we potentially can restore intestinal barrier function during aging? So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so these are the specific topics that we're gonna be covering today. So we're gonna start off with a little bit about the intestinal barrier and how that changes with age, how it's involved in aging potentially. Then we're gonna spend really the bulk of the presentation on going through an advanced intestinal barrier assessment and learning about the different components of the barrier and how those can be assessed with GI map. And especially we're gonna get into some details here about the key roles of certain microbes, especially the normal commensal microbes in the gut specific nutrients, dietary nutrients, and even just touch on uh, lifestyle factors as well, different ways that we can promote a healthy barrier function and potentially even restore barrier integrity uh, and address intestinal regeneration as part of this process. So let's go ahead and get started. So along the way, uh, I definitely wanna emphasize that we're gonna be bringing to this presentation several new perspectives. And again, these are emerging from recent research uh, that I think really kind of set the stage for potentially a new paradigm in how we view the intestinal barrier, especially during aging, and then how we can potentially approach that with various therapeutic approaches. So the first perspective here is uh, essentially the one I just mentioned a little bit earlier about looking at this intestinal barrier as sort of an integrative, comprehensive whole where all the different components interact extensively and that really constitutes the fully functional barrier. So it goes way beyond the concept of leaky gut. Again, we will focus on that a bit, but we're gonna zoom out into this concept of uh, intestinal barrier as a much more complex system, uh, which actually offers us more opportunities to intervene therapeutically. Then we're gonna consider kind of here and there as we go through the research and the different topics uh, we, we generally tend to think in the functional medicine field of gut healing is essentially sort of one thing uh, where you're treating the gut, helping the gut to heal, et cetera. Uh, but again, a lot of the, the new perspectives that have been coming out of this research sheds light on the differences in the barrier and the environment and the microbiome along the GI tract. Uh, so especially as you move from the small intestine into the large intestine. So we will be touching on that because that obviously pertains to how you might want to treat a given patient with intestinal barrier dysfunction. Then there's the newer concept of postbiotics. So this is an exciting area of research uh, where we're looking at a lot of these products that are produced by the microbiome and research is starting to illuminate some of these key roles that they play in promoting a normal healthy barrier and how deficiencies or excesses in some of them can actually contribute to intestinal barrier dysfunction. So we are going to talk a bit about the postbiotics here, how that relates to the microbiome and the intestinal barrier. Uh, and in particular, we're going to focus on this uh, in the latter part of the webinar, uh, which I think is leading towards a new paradigm in how we view gut healing. So again, this is taking into account lots of different new perspectives, uh, and essentially all these uh, factors that we just listed above. So we're looking at more comprehensive view of the barrier, the different components, how that barrier changes uh, as we go from different parts of the GI tract, and then how that pertains to dietary factors and how those differ 
along the way, and also microbes in their products. Uh, so a lot to take into account here. Again, we are gonna cover quite a bit of information. Uh, you will have the recording, of course, in the slides. Um, so if you miss anything here that we go through today, you'll have the opportunity to catch that later. All right, so let's go ahead and start off with this first topic about the intestinal barrier and how that may be involved in aging as well as longevity. Some of you may be familiar with this if you're uh, following the aging and longevity field. Uh, this is a new article that was just published a couple months ago. That's actually an update of a really well-known article that was published about 10 years ago. So the original article was on the hallmarks of aging and they originally listed, uh, I think, nine different hallmarks of aging. Get into what those are in just a moment. Uh, and this recent update uh, reflects all the new research from the past 10 years since that first publication. And now they've added a few new uh, hallmarks of aging, including dysbiosis and inflammation. So we are gonna talk about those uh, particularly today. But just a little bit about these hallmarks. They say aging is driven by hallmarks fulfilling the following three premises. Number one, their age associated manifestation. So essentially they're changing with age, uh, either increasing or decreasing. The acceleration of aging by experimentally accentuating them. And then number three, the opportunity to decelerate, stop, reverse aging by therapeutic interventions. And of course, that's what we're all interested in is not only what are the changes, how do we assess those changes, uh, because they may be different from patient to patient, and then how do we address those therapeutically, especially when it comes to the intestinal barrier biome. This is a figure summarizing these 12 different hallmarks of aging. We're not going to go through all of these today, of course. Oh, that would be a pretty comprehensive webinar, but we are going to touch on some of these key hallmarks that pertain to the intestine in particular and also the barrier. Again, a couple of these are new, just added uh, in this new article. That's dysbiosis, chronic inflammation, stem cell exhaustion. Uh, so we are going to focus on that. That has to do with the stem cells in the intestinal crypts that play central roles in regenerating the intestinal barrier. Now we're also going to touch on mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, especially uh, in terms of the metabolism of the colon epithelial cells, in other words, the colonocytes. So that's an especially important factor for all cells, of course, uh, but also for colon cells. All right, so this is another figure from this uh, recently published article on the hallmarks. And this one is pertaining especially to the dysbiosis that occurs with aging. So it's summarizing some of these changes and related information. As you can see here depicted in the middle, uh, they basically list uh, two sort of simplistic trajectories that can happen during aging. So the normal trajectory during normal aging is on the right, uh, featuring age-related decline which may actually even be accelerated in patients that have gut dysfunction. And then on the left, we have the potential opportunities in promoting healthy aging by addressing some of these imbalances and potentially correcting them. So let's go ahead and dive in to this a little bit more. So we're gonna start on the right here and just uh, look at some of these changes that have been documented in terms of the age-related decline. So we know that there's generally a decrease in beneficial microbes uh, we are going to talk a fair amount about that today. That's one of the uh, key areas that we want to be familiar with uh, so we can recognize which ones are deficient, uh, which ones really play an important role in the barrier, uh, and potentially what we can do to support them. Uh, but also with aging, there's often an increase in the harmful microbes, uh, especially the inflammatory type microbes that may contribute to inflammation during aging, which is another one of the hallmarks of aging. We are going to talk about short chain fatty acids. Of course, those are the key products produced by the beneficial microbes, and those tend to decrease in many patients, in many individuals, uh, when they're increasing in age. Uh, so that's definitely something we want to focus on and talk about the impact there as well. In terms of the pathologies, of course, these changes may play a role in a wide variety of age-related conditions. A number of, list, of them are listed here, but a lot of the microbiome changes and changes in the intestinal barrier pertain to this generally increased systemic inflammation with age, and that seems to underlie most, if not all, 
of these age-related disorders. We're also going to take a look at some of these interventions. Uh, so we certainly know that there's a lot of uh, well-characterized interventions to help generally improve the balance in the microbiome. Again, many of these do pertain to the scenario for promoting healthy aging. So it has to do with prebiotics, probiotics, uh, again, this category we're going to focus on, especially today, the postbiotics. And there's some really interesting, exciting research coming out there. Also, caloric restriction and different types of fasting. Of course, plant-based diets, which are the key source of prebiotics, and uh, polyphenols as well, which are known to help promote a healthy microbiome. And then on the left, we have uh, different um, sort of imbalances or therapeutic approaches that we can take into account to promote homeostasis in the gut uh, that can promote healthy aging. So we know that digestion absorption generally tend to decrease with age. So making sure that there's adequate digestion can be helpful. Certainly protecting against pathogens uh, and infections uh, and the decrease in beneficial microbes is one of the key factors there that can increase susceptibility. Uh, then we have the production of these essential metabolites. And again, those are the postbiotics primarily produced by the beneficial bacteria. Uh, and then there's also the gut axis, the gut brain axis, the gut lung axis, et cetera, that plays a really important role in basically causing these changes that can happen in the gut to then affect distant organs in the body. That can pertain to different pathologies depending on an individual's susceptibility. All right, so I just want to read a quote here from this uh, article on the hallmarks of aging. They say, inflammation increases during aging and that's called inflammaging. So that's the chronic inflammation, low-grade inflammation that tends to be widely seen during aging. Um, that increases during aging with systemic manifestations, as we just talked about. Uh, inflammation occurs as a result of multiple derangements that stem from the other hallmarks. So as you can imagine, these hallmarks are very interactive. They influence one another. Uh, so when you start to have one hallmark that's trending in the wrong direction, that can start to cascade and affect some of these other hallmarks. They also say inflammation is exacerbated by perturbations of circadian rhythms and then also by intestinal barrier dysfunction. Uh, those two actually go hand in hand. That's kind of beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today, but there's increasing research on the role of disruption of circadian rhythms and how that can also lead to dysfunctional uh, aging or accelerated aging. Uh, this is uh, one last figure that I'm going to show from this paper here. Uh, it looks a little bit complicated here, but I'm going to summarize here at the bottom. It says, figure seven, integration of these hallmarks. Again, they say all 12 of the hallmarks of aging that are proposed in this work are functionally related among each other. These determinants of aging are also interconnected to the eight hallmarks of health. So along with these hallmarks of aging, uh, they've also identified hallmarks of other chronic diseases as well. Uh, and then recently, uh, these hallmarks of health have been proposed and identified. Well, I just want to call out a couple of these, and these are depicted here on the right of this figure. Uh, so these can, of course, decrease with age as well. Uh, so there's the integrity of barriers, especially the intestinal barrier. And also repair and regeneration can be compromised. Uh, and that's a big part of what we're going to focus on today in terms of how the repair process in the gut happens, how that can change with age. Uh, and then certain microbes, in particular in their products, um, that may help to improve repair and regeneration. So again, a very exciting area of research. Of course, uh, these types of changes, and especially the inflammation that occurs with aging, dysbiosis, uh, intestinal barrier dysfunction, uh, that's thought to be a driving factor in this phenomenon of inflammaging. Summarized in this recent review article, where they say, the intestinal barrier composed of the luminal microbiota, the mucus layer, and the physical barrier consisting of epithelial cells and immune cells. So I highlighted that part of this quote here because this is again speaking to this larger picture of the intestinal barrier. So again, we're often thinking particularly of leaky gut, uh, but this is reminding us that uh, in general, in kind of this holistic view of the intestinal barrier, we know that it's composed of the microbiota, uh, again, they produce lots of products that influence the other components of the layer. There's the mucus layer that tends to keep microbes 
especially pathogens, away from the epithelium and the intestinal lining, also the immune cells. And those, of course, have a very protective function. Uh, but they also produce factors that can reinforce the other components of the barrier and help manage them. I want to say besides changes in the composition and function of cellular junctions, so those are the tight junctions that basically keep the cells close together. Uh, so that's basically helping to prevent excessive leaky gut. Also, when those cellular junctions or tight junctions are not functioning well, of course, that's what we call leaky gut. But they're again directing our attention that the entire gastrointestinal physiology actually can contribute to these age related changes. So, we're going to consider some of those today. Of course, the bottom line here that they summarize in this quote is that targeted interventions to improve overall barrier function will be important disease prevention strategies for healthy aging. I say in the future, but actually, of course, in our field, a lot of these uh, approaches are already being used uh, for patients, um, and they, of course, involve dietary and lifestyle factors. So they're already readily available in many ways so that we can start to intervene potentially help to improve the barrier with age. All right, so the uh, last, last part of this uh, webinar, really the bulk of it is gonna be focused on how do we go through, and now that we know some of these components, uh, we're gonna talk about them a bit more here. How do we recognize these on a GI map? Uh, so basically, how do we assess the patient's intestinal barrier in this more comprehensive way? And then how do these different factors potentially play a role in the microbiome, in the intestinal barrier uh, with aging. Uh, so that's really the last part we're also going to uh, focus on here and there throughout the rest of the presentation. So this is a depiction of the intestinal barrier, basically illustrating the key components here. So I want to draw your attention first to the tight junctions. Uh, so again, those are the key structures that help keep the cells together and prevent leaky gut. Uh, again, that's a large part of what's focused on, especially from a testing standpoint in the functional medicine field. Uh, so that's been a standard now for quite a long time, uh, going back 20 years or more. Uh, so we certainly have a lot of ways to assess uh, the state of leaky gut. Um, GI map, of course, uh, our key marker there is on you. I'm going to talk about that momentarily. But again, we want to zoom out here and look at the rest of the barrier and consider how do we assess some of these other components so we can get a more comprehensive view of what's going on with the barrier? So of course there's the bacteria themselves, uh, the good guys in particular, but also the bad guys that can disrupt the barrier. Really important mucus layer, uh, which you can see here is sort of depicting how the mucus layer keeps the microbes away from the epithelium and the immune cells. And that helps to keep the microbes from overstimulating the immune system and causing excessive inflammation. Now here towards the bottom on the right, uh, they're depicting secretory IgA. So that's produced by certain immune cells in the lamina propria, and then that gets secreted out into the mucus layer, and that's depicted here. And that's a really important aspect of the barrier, and essentially largely um, sort of coexists with the mucus layer, uh, since the secretory IgA is largely contained in the mucus layer. Then we have the very important epithelial cells. So they're often sort of overlooked because we're really focusing mostly traditionally on these tight junctions and leaky gut. But the cells themselves have many important functions and there's of course many different subtypes of cells that make up the intestinal epithelium. In addition to that, there's also the epithelial regeneration that happens in the crypts that involves stem cells. Again, we are gonna focus on that today. Uh, then, of course, there's the immune cells in the lamina propria. Uh, and again, just a reminder that all of these components interact extensively together to form this system. It's essentially our interface with the environment. Uh, so it's important, again, to be able to understand how do you assess these different factors on comprehensive stool testing. So just to summarize, these are the key barrier components. We have the microbiome. We have secreted factors, including in particular the mucus, secretory IgA, uh, and something we're not gonna focus on much today, but also very important are the AMPs, which stands for antimicrobial peptides. Those are secreted by a variety of cells, including the epithelial cells and also immune cells. Uh, this can again help to manage the microbiome. And uh, they're discovering additional roles of these antimicrobial peptides as well, 
some of which actually help to improve and promote barrier function. So secretive factors are very important for barrier function. Again, the epithelial layer itself, both the combination of specialized cells, uh, including the goblet cells, in particular that make or secrete the mucus, and then the tight junctions. And then there's the mucosal immune system, including both innate and adaptive cells that are primarily in the lamina propria. So now we're gonna dive in to look at some individual components of GMAP that can help you get some great insights into the intestinal barrier. Uh, those have to do with insights into the microbial ecosystem, as well as intestinal physiology. So let's start off, talk a little bit about the tight junctions and the key marker there, which is zonulin. Uh, this is just uh, one uh, fairly recent review article from 2012. Um, that was summarizing the state of what's known about zonulin at that time. Uh, so they say here, our discovery of zonulin, the only known physiological modulator of intercellular tight junctions described so far, increased understanding of the intricate mechanisms that regulate the intestinal epithelial paracellular pathway, and led us to appreciate that its upregulation in genetically susceptible individuals leads to autoimmune diseases. So this was again written a little over 10 years ago by one of the leading researchers uh, in the field. Uh, so this is actually referring to, at the time, the connection with autoimmune diseases. Uh, but now we know, of course, that leaky gut and presonulin has been observed in a wide variety of conditions from metabolic conditions, cardiovascular disease, uh, even aging itself. Uh, so definitely a common feature of aging and also a long list of diseases and conditions. You can see here an example on GMAP where zonion was elevated. And again, keep in mind that when you do see that elevated, uh, that certainly is a very significant indicator of increased leaky gut. Uh, but also keep in mind that this isn't the only marker, again. So this is something that you may not always see it elevated in patients where you suspect intestinal barrier issues. So that's really your clue to look at what are some of these other barrier components that may also be compromised. So that leads us to secretory IgA, which we're gonna talk about next. So that's here on GMAP. And this is an example here where the patient uh, had a pretty low level down at 454, definitely deficient there. And then I just wanna illustrate here this connection. So this is a figure from a review article where they're really nicely illustrating this connection between secretory IgA and the factors that promote its production. So among the key factors would be the short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate. So that's been established for quite a while. We know that connection really well. We also know that that's related to the commensal bacteria, of course, that produce the short chain fatty acids from fibers. So that's really your connection there in terms of dietary factors that promote a wide range of beneficial bacteria that then can produce these short chain fatty acids that stimulate the production of secretory IgA. So if you do see low secretory IgA, it's very common to see a lack of normal bacteria, which we see here in the commensal section. Uh, so you can see for this particular patient, they were very deficient across a wide range of these commensals. We're gonna get into some details here about these various microbes in the commensal section and how they specifically contribute to intestinal barrier health. But just note that in particular, when you see low secretory IgA, you're especially likely to see low acromancia and or low butyrate producers, and those are Fecalibacterium and also Rosburia. Then at a high level, we also have the phyla. So we certainly know that the bacteroidetes and Firmicutes make up about 95% of all the microbes in the colon. Um, they are the main source of short-chain fatty acids. So if you see those also deficient, that's telling you that at a broad level, this patient is likely deficient in short chain fatty acids, and that can explain in large part the decrease in their secretory IgA. All right, so let's dive into the mucus layer. See that there's quite a bit of research here as well in terms of what's going on with aging, uh, which microbes seem to play an important role, etc. So that's partly illustrated here uh, in this figure from a recent review article where they're actually depicting. Uh, this is the colon, uh, and the colon has two mucus layers. There's an outer mucus layer and then a thicker inner mucus layer. So the inner mucus layer is generally not easily accessible by most microbes, 
Uh, but you can see here that they list proteobacteria. Primarily that's referring to Escherichia or E. coli. So that's one of the key microbes in the commensal section on GMAP. Um, that tends to live very near or even attached to the epithelial layer in this thick mucus layer. Um, otherwise, other than those few microbes, uh, generally there's not uh, many microbes in this thicker mucus layer. So it's helping to keep most of them away. Uh, the outer layer is thinner and there are more microbes there. Uh, some of the key species would include Acromantia and then also various Bacteroides species. So those are common residents uh, that thrive in the mucus layer. So you can basically make the connection when you look at all the research that uh, and it's best, really best established for Acromantia that when you have a uh, lack of Acromantia, that can often indicate that there's likely a lack of mucus. There's a strong connection there. So it can be an indirect indicator that patients may be deficient in their mucus production. Again, that's the Escherichia, Acromantia, and then the Bacteroidetes phylum. Uh, we often will see these three decreased uh, altogether, along with low secretory IgA. These are often in patients where uh, their conditions or symptoms may be related to intestinal barrier dysfunction. Let's talk a little bit more about Acromantia. A lot of research coming out about this microbe. So the title here is Action and Function of Acromantia mucinophila, Microbiome Ecology, Health and Disease. So it's a recent review article. Uh, let's cut to the um, highlighted area here where they say Acromantia is particularly effective in increasing mucus thickness and increasing gut barrier function. So this is emphasizing that not only does it thrive on mucus and depends on mucus, but in this, at the same time, it's actually producing factors that are helping to promote mucus production. So a really important part of the ecosystem. And Acromantia is actually well known now to, through its actions on mucus proteins, uh, proteins, it's able to break down and release some of the sugars from the mucus and then makes those sugars available to other microbes. So it's actually helping to support the overall ecosystem. This is a, another recent article on the age-associated impairment of the mucus barrier and its association with profound changes in the microbiota and immunity. And they found uh, that the barrier defects were accompanied by major changes in the fecal microbiota and significantly decreased abundance of acromantia, which is strongly and negatively affected by age in humans. Uh, so we know from a number of studies that a subset of people as they're getting older tend to have a deficiency in acromantia uh, that may have some functional implications, which we'll see momentarily. Um, they go on to say here that um, the opposite is actually observed in centenarians. Uh, so, of course, in long-lived people, that may be one of the protective factors, is that they're able to maintain a higher level of acromantia, which is then helping to maintain a more functional intestinal lining. So this is just one example of many studies that are documenting that acromantia seems to be one of the common features in centenarians, and so they mentioned here, it appears to be even at the level of potential biomarker in centenarians in terms of gut health. All right, so working backwards here, back to our figure, uh, we have the stimulation of mucus production by the short chain fatty acids. Uh, and that's of course produced again by the commensal bacteria that are metabolizing fiber. So just to make that connection there. So this is a depiction from an article from a few years ago, uh, depicting the difference between uh, the intestinal barrier on a fiber rich diet. See here that the microbes in green are depicting the fiber degrading microbiota. In that scenario, then again, where they're producing a lot of short chain fatty acids and other beneficial, micro or bene beneficial microbial products, um, then you basically end up with a nice thick mucus layer. But simply on a fiber-free diet without any other interventions, that can lead to a depletion, <clears throat> excuse me, of the mucus layer, um, partly through decreasing these fiber-degrading microbiota, uh, and then of course decreasing the short-chain fatty acids that they produce. So on GI map again, you'll see <clears throat> evidence of this potentially with the bacterial phyla. Both of those are listed as low for this patient. And also the two key keystone beta producers, Fecalibacterium and also Rosburia. So these are important signs to look for 
Uh, and often it's something you would expect in patients that are just not consuming adequate fiber, typically consuming more of the standard sad American diet. A few more things I want to mention about butyrate before we move on is uh, this is depicting uh, essentially another role of butyrate in promoting the tight junctions and so helping to decrease leaky gut. So they show here that butyrate can be taken up by the colonocytes, colon cells in particular. Uh, and basically butyrate stimulates the expression of genes for the tight junction structure. That's one way in which butyrate can actually help improve the barrier function. And butyrate actually acts through several different mechanisms. That's just one. This is referring to a second one, which turns out to be uh, really very important for the health of the colon in particular. So they say here, the uh, title is Microbial Metabolite Regulation of Epithelial Cell-Cell Interactions and Barrier Functions. Uh, research, uh, certainly this has been known for a while now, but research shows that more than 95% microbiota-derived butyrate is utilized by the colon cells for energy. So the vast majority of their energy that they need in order to function and do jobs comes from butyrate from the microbiome. So butyrate is really an essential factor for health of these colon cells. Now let's look at the importance of that here. I'll summarize in this article, it says colonocyte metabolism shapes the gut microbiota. They say during gut homeostasis, obligate anaerobic bacteria, so that's primarily your bacteroidetes and your firmicutes, uh, and especially the butyrate producers, uh, convert fiber into fermentation products. Again, they single out butyrate to maintain the epithelium in a metabolic state characterized by high oxygen consumption. This metabolic polarization of differentiated colonocytes maintains epithelial hypoxia to limit the amount of oxygen diffusing into the gut lumen. Uh, so if you kind of connect the dots here, uh, the butyrate that's produced by these beneficial microbes is metabolized by the colon cells, and that metabolic process uses up oxygen. So oxygen is coming in from the circulation, uh, but basically that causes the colon cells, the, the colon intestinal lining, to essentially act as a filter and basically soak up all the oxygen uh, so that it can't really get into the lumen of the colon. Um, that's thought to be the major determinant of the anaerobic environment in the colon. So it's kind of this sort of circular beneficial um, process where these microbes produce butyrate, butyrate helps keep their environment anaerobic so they can continue to thrive and produce more butyrate. So really essential overall for the overall function of the, the colon. All right, so in terms of promoting large intestinal barrier health, and this is where we start to differentiate between supporting, for example, small intestine versus large intestine. Um, so all of the traditional methods that are popular for supporting gut health, uh, gut healing, for example, um, supplements like butyr, uh, not butyrate, but uh, glutamine, zinc carnosine, uh, B, et cetera, DGL, uh, mucilaginous herbs, those tend to function more in the small intestine. So especially the glutamine and the zinc carnosine are really promoting health in the small intestine. But again, in the large intestine, it depends a lot more on the resident bacteria and the products they're producing. So again, that comes down to these commensals and their metabolites. Again, looking at the overall bacteroides and firmicutes, especially Fecalibacterium and Rosbiria, those are keystone butyrate producers. Acromantia, which we're gonna also learn a bit more about that still. And also bifidobacterium. We're not going to focus too much on that today, but it's another one of the important um, bacteria in the colon that can help promote overall health of the intestinal lining in the colon. So in terms of the general approaches in supporting these beneficial commensals, we summarize that as essentially this uh, easy to remember mnemonic, the four Ps, which is prebiotics, of course, fiber, fermentable carbohydrates. Probiotics, a wide range of probiotics can be helpful as well. More and more information has been coming out about polyphenols. They do seem to be almost as important as prebiotics, and they actually tend to be synergistic with pre prebiotics and their beneficial effects. And then this category that I mentioned earlier that we're going to focus a bit more on is the postbiotics. Um, so we just talked about butyrate. Also, bile acid metabolites are important. We're not going to focus on that today, 
But microbes, of course, produce various vitamins that can be supportive of the intestinal lining. We will cover one example there. Uh, but we are going to focus a bit more on the indoles and then something called urolithin A, uh, which are products of the microbiome. Uh, and also, in the case of indoles, uh, can also be found in the diet. Uh, there are many other metabolites that are being characterized. I just wanted to highlight those because there's a lot of really interesting research uh, recently coming out about those. So all this to say that assessing the intestinal barrier, if you want to kind of break this down into kind of the core approach, certainly you want to look at on the right side, the factors that promote a healthy barrier. Um, the colon is going to be a little bit different from the small intestine. Colon, you're looking at factors like acromancia, butyrate producers, et cetera. Um, but then you're also wanting to consider the factors that disrupt or damage the barrier to get the comprehensive picture, the full picture of what's going on. Of course, in terms of GMAP, uh, certainly pathogens, opportunists can disrupt the barrier. There are a lot of lifestyle dietary factors as well. Those are actually summarized here in this recent review article. So just kind of going through some of the factors here, starting at the top, we know pathogens, various environmental stresses, environmental toxins, uh, mold toxins, for example, uh, just lots of different types of exposures uh, certainly can affect the microbiome and the barrier. Very well documented, of course, that processed, highly processed diets, especially if they're lacking fiber, um, can also result in dysfunction of the barrier. Uh, then a growing list of drugs, uh, particularly antibiotics, but even in a longer list there, uh, those are just some of the factors that we know of. There are many others as well. So lots of factors to assess and just consider when you're assessing your patients uh, in terms of their barrier. Uh, but at the core of this, these different factors can change the microbiome. They can cause dysbiosis, and they can also directly damage the barrier. So there's lots of different ways in which these can lead to dysfunction. In terms of the inflammatory microbes uh, that, that can be part of that dysbiosis, uh, that these various factors can cause, uh, that especially pertains to the inflammatory microbes. So on GMAP, you'll see two sections on page three in the opportunistic sections. We have the inflammatory and autoimmune related bacteria, and then we have the commensal inflammatory and autoimmune related bacteria. So the only difference here is uh, the commensals are normally part of the microbiome. Uh, you'll see those numbers present in virtually everyone. Um, they do actually have beneficial functions, especially the Escherichia that we talked about. That actually can help promote the intestinal barrier in several ways. But at the same time, when they're elevated, when they're out of balance, they can either be a sign of inflammation uh, or they may also contribute to inflammation. Uh, so for example, Pterobacter and Escherichia, uh, and also Fusobacterium produce a more inflammatory type of LPS. So when it's elevated, Escherichia is not a great sign, but also when it's deficient, it's a great sign. All right, so basically if you have a patient that appears to have uh, this type of dysbiosis, some evidence of barrier dysfunction, and we know that can have uh, impacts in, in the gut itself in terms of the immune response. That's depicted here and further down in the figure. Uh, you can get basically increased inflammation uh, you can also get leaky gut that leads to uh, endotoxemia, basically, when the LPS gets into systemic circulation. So on GM map, one of the key markers here, of course, is, GI, is uh, calprotectin. So that, when it's elevated, that can be a sign that there's inflammation, especially in the colon. Uh, you'll often see that along with a decrease in certain normal bacteria, particularly fecalibacterium, that one is especially sensitive to uh, inflammation. And then you'll often see an increase in the inflammatory microbes, again, especially on page three. Ultimately, all of this can lead to metabolic endotoxemia and then low-grade systemic inflammation. And this is back to one of the articles we featured earlier that that can lead to this phenomenon of inflammaging. It's summarized here just in the title. All right, so these are all the barrier components uh, that we can get some insights from on GM map. So again, really thinking uh, much further beyond just tight junctions and leaky gut, uh, start to see the barrier in a more holistic way, a more comprehensive way. Um, this really kind of fits with the overall increasing focus on systems biology. So really seeing 
the intestinal barrier as this highly interactive system that we have ways to assess this uh, and also therapeutically intervene. So with that, now I wanna focus a little bit more on the epithelial cells and especially the phenomenon of epithelial regeneration from the stem cells in the crypt and then illustrate some examples for how the microbiome plays an essential role in helping to promote that process. This is a recent article titled Intestinal Stem Cell Aging at Single Cell Resolution, Transcriptional Perturbations Alter Cell Developmental Trajectory Versus Bigeral Therapeutics. So this is just an example of recent research where they're getting into some of these details about what's going on at the barrier and then looking at can that be reversed uh, with certain either pharmaceuticals or nutraceuticals. Uh, but they say here the intestinal mucosa is a prime example of the decline in regenerative capacity, increase in cellular damage, and metabolic dysregulation that characterizes aging. Uh, so we definitely know that this ability of the gut to regenerate with age uh, decreases on um, that stem cell dysfunction as part of uh, those key hallmarks overall of the aging. They go on to say, the potential role of perturbations in intestinal stem cells is of particular interest in understanding aging since these cells renew and maintain the mucosa through their continuous division at the crypt base. So a really important process, and I think it's largely overlooked so far uh, in terms of the concept of gut healing. Again, there's been so much focus on leaky gut, uh, making sure the tight junctions uh, are functioning properly, et cetera. Uh, we're kind of missing this part of the picture here, and there's now enough research that we potentially can, can uh, consider that um, in terms of our therapeutic approaches. So let's look a little bit more detail here. This is a figure from a recent article. Um, I'm going to go through some of the details here in case you're not that familiar with this aspect of intestinal regeneration. So this is depicting here on the right a typical crypt. Um, this would be uh, depicting the situation in the small intestine, because uh, you can see there on the left of the figure, there's a villus depicted, which the colon doesn't have. The colon does have, of course, intestinal crypts. Uh, so both the small and the large intestine can regenerate based on stem cells in the crypt. Um, basically, once those stem cells um, are receiving signals to divide and to proliferate, then they start to move up the crypts. So you have these dividing cells, proliferative cells that are going up the crypts. Uh, and then eventually when they get further up into the villus, they differentiate, that's the, the term for, they develop kind of their mature different subtypes. So different stem cells ultimately become uh, different types of epithelial cells. We have a few different examples illustrated here, goblet cells and pterocytes pteroendocrine cells and something called a tuft cell. So again, a very, very important process for generating all these different functional types of cells that we need in order for the intestine to function properly. And then at the top of the villus, we can see here that basically that's where these epithelial cells eventually start shedding. <clears throat> so that's the typical process that happens on a regular basis. And we know that the overall, the intestinal lining is turning over uh, completely new cells on average every five days or so. So it's a fairly rapid process. And the intestine actually is the most regenerative tissue in the body. Uh, so this is happening continuously, very energy intensive, uh, it's certainly a process that needs to be very carefully regulated. And that's where the normal commensal microbiome comes into play. This is a, another recent review article where they're talking about the potential of using what we know about this process and the factors that can influence the regeneration, and how that may be applied potentially to certain disease conditions. In this case, they're talking about inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, but in the excerpt, they say, emerging evidence points towards the microbiota as a critical factor in inducing tissue repair after intestinal damage. They talk a little bit about, uh, in a separate article, how acromantia is one of those microbes. Uh, it's being better characterized in terms of its role in intestinal regeneration. Um, you can just tell here from the title that acromantia accelerates intestinal stem cell mediated epithelial development. So there's a growing amount of research, including this uh, example here, where they say the microenvironment of injured 
uh, mouse gut elicits a local pro-restitutive or pro-regenerative microbiota. Uh, they say these data confirm that acromancia, other wound-associated bacteria, promote mucosal wound repair. And they give a little bit of details here on the mechanism uh, where they promote epithelial proliferation and migration. So acromancia is really emerging as uh, overall a very important microbe in many ways for the health of the intestinal barrier. Uh, then we also have various lactobacillus species. So this is an example for lactobacillus rotary. Uh, it says that that particular species maintains intestinal epithelial regeneration and repairs damaged intestinal mucosa. So we have some examples here. Lactobacillus, another one. Microbiota-derived lactate accelerates intestinal stem cell-mediated epithelial development. Uh, and lactate is the main product produced primarily by lactobacillus species, uh, but also some others as well. Uh, then there's uh, E. coli. Uh, so the title here is Biotin Controls Intestinal Stem Cell Mitosis and Host Microbiome Interactions. Um, they say here that biotin produced by E. coli regulates intestinal stem cell proliferation. That's the ISC. Uh, they mentioned that bacteroides, uh, bacteroidetes uh, also contribute to biotin production. Uh, and then they also mentioned that diet as well. So that's the last quote. Collectively, we have discovered a fascinating example of how nutrients and specifically diet or microbiota derived biotin and modulate intestinal stem cell activity and control tissue homeostasis, regeneration, and intestinal tumor genesis. Uh, so again, just some examples here of some of this fascinating research on how these various microbes can produce products that then help to regulate this whole regeneration process. So that's leading to this overall concept here that uh, illustrated on the left that when we have inflammation and damage to the barrier involving dysbiotic microbes, that can result in damaged epithelial cells, which normally is repaired in a healthy gut. Uh, but part of that repair depends on this, what they're calling here pro-repair microbiota, uh, which is essentially the pro-regenerative microbiota, such as acromancia. So if you're deficient in those microbes, then of course that suggests that Patients who have chronic inflammation may not be able to fully repair their intestinal lining when they're deficient. So again, just to summarize these key microbes that we've been talking about that can play a role potentially in regeneration are Escherichia, Lactobacillus, Acromancia, Bacteroidetes in particular. So those are some of the best studied so far. Um, now in the last few minutes here before we take questions, I want to just touch briefly on um, some additional dietary microbial metabolites that we uh, know about that are emerging from research that may help to improve barrier function and may even promote uh, barrier regeneration. So we just talked about earlier the uh, butyrate that can be produced uh, by the microbes in response to fermentable carbs. And now I'm going to focus just briefly on uh, this uh, really interesting metabolite or postbiotic produced from various foods, various uh, polyphenols, such as the ones in pomegranate. Uh, cruciferous vegetables, also we'll touch on that. There's quite a bit more to say there, but we probably don't have enough time to go through all of that. Um, vitamin D, certainly that's well known uh, to help promote barrier function in general. Um, and then we have the NAD precursors, such as nicotinamide riboside. Uh, they're now also being shown to help promote intestinal barrier regeneration, especially during aging. And then lastly, there's also fasting. So a growing number of studies, fasting may actually benefit uh, this regeneration process. Let's just touch on the urolithin A research here. Uh, title here is Enhancement of the Gut Barrier Integrity by Microbial Metabolite through the NRF2 Pathway. So urolithin A is a major microbial metabolite derived from polyphenols of berries and pomegranates. Uh, it displays anti-inflammatory, antioxidative, and anti-aging activities. Here we show that urolithin A and its potent synthetic analog significantly enhance gut barrier function and inhibit unwarranted inflammation. So again, yet another example of a microbiome product from certain dietary sources that can be very beneficial in promoting barrier health. Now, this is another example of the mitophagy activator urolithin A is safe and induces a molecular signature of improved mitochondrial and cellular health in humans about how urolithin A uh, can basically help stimulate mitophagy and improve muscle health in this case in old animals, and also preclinical models of aging. 
Uh, they say it induces a molecular signature of improved mitochondrial and cellular health following regular oral consumption in humans. So it's now being studied in clinical trials as well. Let's go ahead and just briefly talk about the cruciferous vegetable connection, especially in terms of the indoles. So that's another up and coming a category of postbiotics. This is a recent review article titled uh, AHR, which stands for aryl hydrocarbon receptor in the intestinal microenvironment, safeguarding barrier function. Their homeostatic conditions, uh, this ligand dependent receptor, uh, signaling by dietary or microbiota derived ligands in various immune and non hemophilic Biotic cells is critical for the preservation of intestinal barrier integrity and function. Skip this one here, just due to lack of time. Um, but we can see here there's a connection between certain microbes that can take uh, tryptophan, the amino acid tryptophan, especially lactobacillus species, um, and also indoles that are available in cruciferous vegetables. And then those can activate this receptor that then has a variety of beneficial functions on intestinal barrier health. Uh, but when we have a deficiency in those sources of indoles, again, either lack of lactobacillus, lack of cruciferous vegetables and other sources in our diet, that can lead to, uh, shown here on the right, dysbiosis, bacterial overgrowth, reduced barrier integrity, reduced tight junctions, et cetera. Uh, so obviously that can be yet another factor that can compromise the barrier if we don't have sufficient intake of the dietary components here and the right microbes. Uh, we'll get into detail here, but just note here in the last part of this quote that these particular precursors in cruciferous vegetables require stomach acid in order to be converted into their active forms. Uh, so that's just another one of these connections I think clinical pearls to be aware of that uh, you really need to have adequate stomach acid in order to get the full benefit uh, from the dietary sources. Just another example of how this is important for colon stem cell health. Um, skip this one. You, again, you'll have the recording and the slides, so you'll be able to look at some of these other studies. Um, that basically just reinforces here that these indoles may have utility as an intervention to limit the decline of barrier integrity and the resulting systemic inflammation that occurs with aging. So lastly, there's uh, just a quick example of vitamin D deficiency. There's a recent article that uh, illustrated that supplementing with these NAD precursors can potentially rejuvenate the aged adult stem cells in the gut. And then lastly, fasting. So there's another example here. Again, there's a growing number of studies. This one says fasting activates fatty acid oxidation to enhance intestinal stem cell function during homeostasis and aging. So potentially lots of different ways in which we can help counteract some of the detrimental effects on the barrier age. So that comes down to, again, assessing the uh, factors that can disrupt the barrier, assessing the ones that can promote the barrier, and just kind of seeing what that balance is, uh, and then looking at these various components and considering, again, the barrier beyond just leaky gut. All right, so thank you so much for listening. Um, I know there's a lot of information here, so you may have some questions in the last couple minutes that we have. Thank you. Yes, we do have time for just maybe a couple questions. Our first question is, what's the recommended fasting time to be effective? That's a great question. So they're still working out some of the details. Um, so it does appear that uh, potentially the longer term, meaning more than just an overnight fast, um, may be required to get the full effects. Um, so it's it's not something that necessarily would be uh, as well promoted by the typical intermittent fasting, um, but even a 24 hour, you know, 48 hour fast uh, might have a bit more of an impact. Uh, but again, that's kind of undergoing active research. So we don't have all of those details yet. Um, just on another note for intermittent fasting, some of the newer research coming out suggests that it may be better uh, if you're going to do the restricted time eating during the day, um, to do that earlier in the day, some studies indicate that skipping breakfast may have worse or less improvement, I should say, than, uh, say, um, skipping dinner. So that's just an example of some of the recent research that has been coming out, but it's kind of an open question at this point as to what's really optimal. Uh, we have some clues, but not really full answers yet.
Thank you. Uh, our next question, um, someone has a few patients with acromancia. Um, is that diet, lifestyle, style, meds, illness, or did they uh, not inherit any from mom? Basically, where do we get acromancia from after birth? That's a great question. Yeah, so it is one of the, um, I wouldn't say first colonizers, but it usually colonizes within the first year of life or so. So definitely, um, Family exposure would be one source. Uh, so if it's not detected in the parents, then presumably it's more likely that it would not be detected in kids. Um, but essentially, uh, the ways to promote it would be, of course, uh, through fiber and polyphenol type diet. So that would be another reason for the levels is just an inadequate diet. Uh, we do know some other scenarios where acromancia may be deficient. Um, such as inflammation, chronic inflammation itself can reduce acromancia, um, and even the pH in the colon. So it does tend to thrive at a certain pH. So if the pH is too low or too high, um, so it has to do with sort of the physiology. A lot of that is actually related to digestive function. Uh, so patients are not digesting well, that can basically alter the pH in the gut. So there's a few things to look at, consider diet, uh, physiology of the GI tract, especially digestion, inflammation, um, and then potentially looking at uh, family members and if it's just not present. Fortunately, now we do have some probiotics available. Finally, I want to thank Dr. Fabian for a great presentation, a lot of great information. Again, I also want to thank all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.